Okay, so I uh, just want to welcome everybody as part of the USA Hockey webinar series. Uh, this is our first one that we're doing and really excited to have Dr. Tiff Jones. And she's, she's uh, a regular within the USA Hockey um, uh, speak as a speaker and has worked our national development camp. So we're really excited to have her. Again, uh, we're on Facebook Live, but also the Zoom. We're going to have a lot in the next couple weeks and months, depending on how long this, this all goes. But give us feedback. And in the chat box on whether it's uh, Facebook Live or Zoom, put where you're coaching. Uh, we want to see all that and pass the word out. Tomorrow we have Martin St. Louis talking about offensive zone play, and it's, it's going to be pretty exciting stuff. And um, you know, to have a, a Hall of Famer coming on. So um, do your thing, Dr. Tiff, and let me know if you have any questions. You got it. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. All right, so this is going to be uh, 10 to 15 minutes probably um, at any point. I'm not sure, Dave, if my video is not working or what, but. Yeah, no video. You just you just have your screen, which is okay, fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm, I mean, I've been doing these now for the last, like, about week and a half for different college coaches and some of my pro coaches and pro athletes and college athletes. And so I was thinking in a TED Talk style, 10 to 20 minutes, what could I really give you guys that you can take and implement? And the biggest thing is let's just cut to the chase and let's just get right to it because this is unprecedented. I know that there's lots of stuff out there. Um, this is a pretty good graph about things that we can control and, you know, focus on. And we talk about to our athletes all the time, like what can we control and what is out of our control and um, are we doing a good job? If we as coaches aren't managing ourselves, then forget about worrying about our kids. And I think we need to, and so I'm going to spend some of the time talking about what you all can do as coaches right now. Because again, if we don't handle ourselves, if we don't manage ourselves, if we don't develop ourselves right now, then why would we ever ask our kids to do the same and our athletes to do the same? So I think, I don't think the things in your control are that shocking. Um, you know, finding fun things, we'll talk about all this kind of stuff. But the one thing I want to point out is how long will this last? I think this is where athletes and coaches are struggling the most with right now, honestly, is because we don't know. And when, when we're so programmed, we have so many things that we want to do as coaches, and we usually have schedules, and we know when our practices are, and when our games are, and when our championships are, and when our nationals are, and when the Olympics are, and everything has been blown up, and we don't have a timeline. And if an athlete is injured, if you as a coach are recovering from an injury, we kind of know, okay, at the three-week mark, you might be off your crutches. At the six-week mark, you can walk and you can run. And, and, and you have these um, markers that you know you can strive for. And right now, we just don't know anything. And so one of the things I can talk to you about is having a week-to-week -week plan. So if you want to have a week plan for yourself and developing yourself as a coach, um, or a week plan for helping your players, um, either performance-wise or relationship-wise, how would you go about doing that? I think the best thing to do is chunk it into weeks. Like, what is our biggest bang for our buck, and what can we get done in this week that can, when we get back on the ice, um, we have closed the gap, we have gotten better, and especially in better in areas that we normally wouldn't take the time to get better in. Um, but I would recommend you do this first as a coach. I would then recommend sharing it, with your players and your team, uh, age appropriate, obviously. Uh, and then I would have each of your players write this out age appropriately. Honestly, a lot of kids, young kids, I would say 10 year olds can do this. Um, so what that is, is if you go back to school and remember what we did in school, which is, you know, you're supposed to write a, a pretty bad draft or just get it down on paper. Um, but in it, it doesn't matter what your grammar is. It doesn't matter if it is spelled correctly. It doesn't matter even if it makes sense. You're just trying to get whatever's in your head down on paper. And so that is what you are. It's the first story that we make up. And in our SFDs, typically this is the story that we're telling ourselves. And the version usually includes all our fears, our insecurities, and our worst case scenarios. And typically, when I've had athletes do this, I just started doing this in January, and it's been probably one of the most successful things I've ever implemented into teams and into my athletes' lives and coaches' lives, is normally we laugh at these. Because today's generation of coaches and, and um, players, typically it's uh, horror stories that we create, like limbs being pulled from torso and bleeding all over the ice. And... You know, a coach like rubs their eye and the kid goes, oh my God, the coach hates me. Oh my God, the coach thinks I suck. Oh my God, if the coach thinks I suck, I'm never going to play again. If I don't play again, what am I going to do? Am I going to get pulled off the ice? 
and never play again. Oh my God, if I do that, like, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Oh my God, I'm going to have to make new friends. What if I'm not the cool kid anymore? And really the coach had an eyelash in their eye. And all of a sudden the kid interprets that as, you know, oh my God, doom and gloom. And really what that shows me is their fears, insecurities, and worst case scenarios. The problem with right now is, is that a lot of it is true. This is like that 1% of the time or 0.001% of the time where this isn't comical. But I want to know if there's false information or conspiracy theories going on in your heads as coaches or going on in your athletes' heads, because that is when we can really help our athletes. Um, Language to me matters. Words matter. Emotions matter. Thoughts matter. And I find that kids and coaches are way better at writing this stuff out than necessarily like having to talk it out. So it's amazing when I've said, I just want an SFD, send me your SFD, the kinds of depth of information that I'm receiving. And some of you might say, well, my male athletes won't do this. Yes, they will. If you buy into this as a coach, if you then show them as a male coach that this is your SFD and you show them your SFD, they will be bought in and be vulnerable and then they will send you your SFDs. And then that is when we can fact check. So now we're going to go through and say what is true, what isn't true. I'm not going to make fun of or um, say that their feelings and their thoughts aren't real. However, I'm also going to go, and now what? It's not but. we got to get rid of the but. So I don't want you to read the SFD and go but because now you've just negated what they're thinking and feeling. So what you want to say is, okay, this is your SFD, and now what are we going to do with this? And what is true? Um, And all that is like super powerful stuff. And let me, I'm going to show you a couple of examples right now. So if you're asking me, what can we do right now? Write out your SFD as a coach. You can't tell me that you're not pissed off that the Olympics and the nationals are canceled and that your championship seasons were canceled or your ability to work with your kids and be around your kids um, is fun. I'm not someone who wants to kumbaya, kumbaya any of this up. It sucks. And now what are we going to do with it? And so I'm all about neutral thinking. I'm all about what can we control right now? And now what are we going to do about this? Not, okay, let's put a positive spin on it. Because most of us right now, frankly, don't want a positive spin. Can positives come out of this? Sure, of course it can. But I'd rather us just stick with neutral. And so before I get into the examples, this wheel is going to help you help yourself and help your kids. So if you start reading SFDs and you start reading these kinds of emotions in your SFDs, like fear, usually that means your kids or yourself are thinking about the future. What if this never ends? What if we don't get the summer to train? What if I get behind? What if I don't get a college scholarship now because no one can watch me play? Like all of these kinds of fears go into what ifs. The anger usually is in the past. So being frustrated or pissed off or mad, that's because we're frustrated with decisions that have been made or we're upset in the past decisions or past things we're not able to do. And so that kind of gives you some indication. The other biggie is this sad category. Typically, if I read any of these emotions in an SFD or I read these emotions in any kind of reflection journal, I would immediately say that it has nothing to do with hockey, but it's going to impact hockey performance. Uh, In this particular case, you may see a lot of the sad emotions because we are isolated. People are going to be sad and depressed and feel abandoned and ignored and powerless and empty because we don't have our sport anymore right now. And so a lot of us are literally going through a psychological and physiological response to not having our passion or our high right now or not being able to do what we absolutely love. So you might see a lot of this, and that would not be surprising to me. But you can equate it to a a drug or you can equate it to something that gives them a lot of adrenaline or euphoria and then say, what if I took that away from you? What would happen? Um, So this is your little cheat sheet. This is just the fear, anger, and sad and what that tends to mean. And here are two examples of SFDs. Um, These were written before all of this happened, just so you know. Um, but I can tell you right now how powerful these are for me to be able to help these two student athletes. One's a softball player, one was a go- is, is a golfer. Um, 
But if you read like the one on the right for the season, I'm just pissed and frustrated and almost overwhelmed. I feel like I'm giving, give my all consistently, especially in the circle. And it seems like I'm the only one. I feel like I'm the only one that is pitching competitively and giving 110% and being that bitch. I'm also feeling very accomplished right now because it's showing me that I am a badass, but I'm also someone that will make a mistake. However, I feel like I can't enjoy being great because there's only three, if that, of us pitchers that are competitive and not making excuses about every pitch. I'm more pissed off because when I try to help another pitcher, I get blown off and is, is told very rudely that she's got it. Like, obviously, I'm doing something right, so let me help you because I'm succeeding and you um, keep getting taken, like, 250 almost every game. Um, so um, that 250 means home run. I'm frustrated because she blames everyone but herself for her mistakes and blah, blah, blah. So as I'm meeting with this, I'm looking at these words. Look at this. Pissed, frustrated, overwhelmed. And I'm going through the emotions. And right away, I know she's frustrated. So that means she's focused on the past. So right away, I can start helping work through this with this athlete. Pissed is in here. Now, on the left-hand side, I'm not going to read that one because you guys are going to get these slides if you want them. Um, this one is living in the future. So a lot of this is fear and anxiety and everything, and that's because she's worried about her future in golf and what it means when she graduates. So right away, how I deal with these two different these athletes right away and understanding them right away is quite um, significant because of just the emotions that they're using in this. And then what I would do is start challenging language. Like, I'm the only one. I, I met with her and I was like, you're the only one that is competitive right now. You are the only one that cares. And so that's where I would fact check this because I'm like, okay, you're being a little ridiculous right now. So that is where I can fact check. But some of this, obviously, I'm like, okay, let's talk more about this. But those are an examples of SFDs. So what can you do now as a coach? You can do your own stinky first draft. You can sit for 10 minutes a day, and this is a good um, thing for your players to do without technology, without distraction, and let your mind wander, and then just write for five minutes. That's different than an SFD. You write an SFD when you are feeling anxious, nervous, sad, pissed off, any of those anger, fear, or sad categories. The sitting is I just want you to sit because we got to let our minds wander. When your mind wander wanders, it usually takes you to where you need to be or where your body or mind needs you to go and deal with the stuff that you need to deal with. So, and typically when you do this, you're going to see patterns and themes emerge over time and you're going to realize like, where does my mind keep going? And do I need to talk to someone like have a fierce conversation? Do I need to train harder? Do I need to get outside and do more exercise? Like where does your head really take you? Um, I'm going to skip the find right now, but for you as a coach, this is a great opportunity to figure out what's holding you back as a coach. Um, what is holding you back and developing a plan, and then that leads into this. So what are you doing for you as a coach? Are you working on your coaching philosophy? Do you even have a coaching philosophy? Two great resources um, is the coaching philosophy workbook through athlete assessments. And if you're someone right now who really wants to work on yourself, this from True North Sports is one of the best resources you can have. Um, which is basically managing yourself. So it helps with emotional regulation. It helps you with your own mental game. Um, it starts to break down. Is your identity too wrapped up in coaching and results right now? Um, I will be very vulnerable and tell you that last week was one of the most challenging probably weeks maybe of my life, but definitely of my career because all of a sudden everything was taken. And I have to reassess, am, is my identity too wrapped up in my mental performance consulting and working with teams and athletes? And even though I'm doing it virtually, it's not the same. And what does that mean for me? Um, down here is a great resource. Celia Slater runs to North Sports. She's doing a huge webinar tomorrow um, for about an hour. I'm speaking on going way more in depth in all of these kinds of areas. Um, she's also going to have a couple other people speak on, on the webinar. So if you want to sign up for that, you can go to her website. Uh, this Managing Yourself book is um, right here on this link. So if that's something that you're interested, this is the time, coaches, for you to take care of you and work on things that you maybe have never worked on. The biggest key is you need to come up with your coaching philosophy. And this is a working document. It's never done through experience, through changes in your life, through the types of players and the generations that you're working with. That coaching philosophy really will probably change significantly through your coaching career. So what else can you do performance related with your teams? I would get your teams after they write their stinky first drafts, 
I would then have them write to you what their routine is. I know this is going around a lot, is form a routine, get up the same time every day, go to sleep as, as closely to the same time, know and plan when you're going to do school, when you're going to do your workout, when you're going to um, train, when you're going to watch Netflix, like have that routine. And I would have it on Google Docs where your team can see everyone else's routine. I would put your routine on there. We can't, we should not be asking our players to do things that we are unwilling to do. Um, you can have them watch film, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Like, it could be um, film of their own games. It could be of the Olympic teams. It could be professionally. Um, and then uh, we're probably not going to talk about this today, which is train with biofeedback. If that's something any of you are interested in, I do this with my college teams and the Olympic teams. We can talk about that. Um, but definitely connecting also virtually with teammates um, and as your team. So if you're going through this, how could we connect players with teammates? Well, this end with you. Well, you could pair everyone up and you show each other an object in your house or you show each other your house. Like so for 15 minutes, I f I'm, I'm showing you things around my house or my dog or my pets or things that are important to me. And then you can flip it and have the other person show that teammate or you as a coach 15 minutes about what they're doing or maybe a puzzle they're working on or whatever they want to say. So that's helping players connect. Um, creating a playlist. So having a playlist of songs. This is one of my favorites. Both the, the men and women and girls and boys love this and every level loves it is send in their favorite pump up song of all time or you could say send me in your favorite pump up song from eighth grade and then they send all the songs to you and then you like kind of type them all out and then the team has to guess who picked which song. And then eventually you have each player explain why that song is their favorite pump up song or their or their most meaningful song. And then what you can do is create a playlist for your team. And when they're working out or whatever, each song kind of triggers a memory of that teammate. And so that's kind of cool. And as coaches, you should partake in that as well. Um, you can just take a picture of an object in your house or something that's really special to you, maybe in your neighborhood or something when you're on a walk. And then you send in that object and you kind of try to guess who that object belongs to. And then that player will eventually provide the reason why. Um, and then going into watching film, you can put players into teams like pods of three, depending on how many, and they can watch a period of hockey, like a certain game that you want. And then you as a coach could have them answer questions because my concern right now is that we we can give workouts that they can do in their garage body weight stuff and everything but this I do not want their brain to atrophy and that is what's going to happen to a lot of athletes and coaches right now is that we stop watching our sport or we don't use our mind and so even though our body will be strong when we get back on the ice our body our minds might not be strong and we got to make sure that we're helping um, athletes be able to have that um quickly and we'll wrap it up here in, in a in a bit uh this is something this is why also the sfds are really good and why i'm going to leave you with the journaling we do not think anything we i mean sorry we do not feel anything unless we think it first i start with emotions because sometimes kids are better with their emotions as you saw on the sfds so i can start with emotions but then it's under getting them to understand that we don't have those feelings without our thoughts and why should we care about emotions um, beyond we should care about humans, but really in terms of performance is because it impacts our biomechanics and our ability to think on the ice. So not only, so if I'm tense, my body tenses up and I turn into like a brick and now my first, like me receiving a puck, uh, it's going to be like, I'm not going to receive it well. It's going to be like 10 feet in front of me because I'm stiff and it's pinging off my stick rather than being able to give with my stick. So that's what happens when you're too tense. And we're not too tense unless we're thinking about something either in the future or in the past. And then how what that does to my brain is I'm not making good decisions. I'm not able to adapt to things. All of that kind of stuff starts to play out in terms of our performance. And so this is where we can start to help them understand. They have to first understand this is either what I feel or what I think. And if it's not optimal for my performance, then I need to change my mindset. And how do I do that? It does not have to be positive, but it cannot be negative. And so the journaling is the key. So if you're going to have your teams work out, if you're going to have your teams try yoga, if you're going to have your, if you're having your team go for a walk or do a, a puzzle or anything like that, the key is that anytime they're doing something performance related or something that you're trying to get them to do for hockey, I would have them reflect. 
okay? So they should be able to say, what were you feeling during that? What were you thinking? What were you attending to? Your five senses, meaning like where it could be something I was smelling something or I started focusing on what I wanted to eat. Um, what worked well or didn't work well? And then how does that relate to your past, present, or future hockey performance? Now, after a while, you can collect these and you're going to start to see patterns and themes amongst your team. And if you do this as well, you're going to start to see patterns and themes in your thinking um, and, and your ability and how that relates to your performance. So here's an example of a golfer who wrote um, a reflection. Um, I was very tense and nervous for the first six just holes. I was a spaz and was getting overwhelmed for no reason. Sorry if spaz is offensive. I'm just reading what she wrote. It took me a while to get into a good groove and be confident with my golf game and not think about the score. I was overwhelmed with my score and wanting to shoot well for the team and myself. I know people watch the scores online and I want to play well. And you can read the rest. And if I go down to here where I said, um, basically, my first draft, was going through my head, which made me more nervous. After realizing that it doesn't help anything, I let go more and took one shot at a time and focused on specific things I could control. So I would ask her, how did you really do that? There were, there were my aim point and my shot targets. There's the how. By being confident with those and repeating them, it helped me focus more distinctly on the specific shot in that moment I need to do the whole time. So what I love about this is up in here, she's worried so much about what other people think. She's worried about results. She's worried about the scores. Think about worry. Worry is about future. And I'm able to start to parcel out and pull out language, emotions, thoughts that then I can ask follow-up questions to. So this is, so going back, you can do the SFDs, you can do the 10 minutes thinking and just journaling, which can be something like this. You can help your team connect with those different ways that we can connect. You as a coach can work on your coaching philosophy and work on yourself and managing yourself as a, as a coach and as a human. Um, and those are my suggestions for getting through this time. So Dave, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it back to you. Yeah, so uh, we have a, a question going on right now from Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do to keep the mind strong? I gave at home workouts to my goalies, but not sure what I can compile to send out for the mental part. Thank you. Okay. So one is having them watch film and then having them to critically think through it and obviously age appropriate. Um, it could be as simple as how many mistakes did this player make and what was their response to the mistake? Um, so that they, you're driving what they're watching during that game and, and making it a challenge or having a really good dialogue among athletes or looking at body language or uh, any, anything that you want to come up with. It can be more tactical, that's fine, but you want them to watch the hockey so that they keep it it's fast in their brains and um, having them critically think through it. Um, you could do a puzzle a jigsaw puzzle and you could say hey team i need you each to get a hundred piece jigsaw puzzle because amazon's still delivering and you're going to have we're going to see who can put the jigsaw puzzle together the fastest um and then do a challenge like that because then what's going to happen is that journaling afterwards is going to be so rich because we're putting pressure on them um and they're being competitive with one another so that could be a suggestion. So anything that you can be, I can always give more options. I mean, I have a whole plethora of them uh, that you can challenge them with different kinds of things and just be really creative. But anything where they're watching the game and or they're having to do something under pressure and then have to journal about it is going to keep their minds sharp. Cool. Does, uh, if anybody else has any questions, um, post them right now if you can. There's a Q&A session or section on the bottom, or you can just type it in the chat, whichever's easiest. So um, if nobody has any questions, oh, here we go. We got Zach <laughs> Sizik. Uh, Zach, Zach actually coaches college hockey. Um, okay. What are your thoughts on re rewards for doing exercises at home? I'm good with, listen, rewards and punishments they Skinner's operant conditioning works really well. I find that it's, it's going to be really hard to consequence. I'm not a big punisher. They're not doing anything to be punished, but I'm rewards and consequences. Um, right now is probably not the time to consequence. Um, but any kind of reward, I'm, I'm totally good for that. How you want a reward is up to you. 
Um, but yeah, I'm all about rewards. I'm not ashamed, whatever it takes to get them to do what we want them to do right now. Um, obviously you're coaching college. I wish they were just more committed and they would want to do it, but let's be realistic. And, um, yeah, again, I'm good with that. Now the consequences I do, I only put consequences on things to create pressure. So I'm not really trying to, I mean, consequence could be like, Hey, you got to put, put in your time for putting the jigsaw puzzle together. Some kids might see that as a consequence because they're being stacked up against other kids, but that's, that's sports, that's life. And as long as you educate about why you're doing it and why you're having them post the results and explain it to them and then explain to them how that's going to help them when they get back on the ice, I'm totally good with it. But if you want to reward and be creative and reward, heck yeah, do it. Uh, we got another question. We actually got two questions from two different uh, Dearborn hockey and Megan. Sorry, I'm not going to um, try the name. But what are some ways uh, to encourage much younger athletes, 10 and under and younger? So we got that kind of on two, two emails. Yeah, I mean, make it fun. Uh, like video. I would video yourself doing it. Like, guys, let's be vulnerable. Like, we want our athletes to do this. We've got to be vulnerable. So um, I, would, I would video yourself doing it and saying, hey, you get to see me do it if I get to see you do it, you know, and have them video themselves and send it or – um, create some sort of platform for your team to do that and make it fun and then reward and encourage um, and applaud and write them notes and say different things. I think for the younger kids, especially that we got to make it fun. We got to make it um, encouraging. We've got to give good feedback. Um, and at this point, as long as they're doing it, I'm psyched. It might be terrible. So I'm not going to say it looked good, but I'm definitely going to reward the effort. So let's not lie to them. But, and let's not lie to them and let's give them like good feedback. And I'm all about the effort right now and the attempt and putting themselves in uncomfortable positions. I'm great with that. I'm going to reward them for that. So. Uh, so Brian Daly asked, uh, obviously this helps in today's situation, but this is also an ongoing approach to performance, correct? Uh, yeah. If you freaking coaches, which is, I wouldn't have a job, so I'm actually appreciative that none of you really do this all the time, but if I hear one more time from coaches, college coaches, professional coaches, we don't have that time to give you, and I'm like, okay, because no coach has lost their job because of the X's and O's. No coach has really lost their job because a kid can't handle a puck like all the, like super well. They can't handle the puck super well because we're not working on the mental part of the game. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is something I wish we did all the time, but I'm, I'm definitely going to take advantage of the fact that you guys have nothing else and I have a captive audience. And maybe if we see that we can do these things, um, when all this is said and done, it's going to make us all better because you guys are going to realize, and I'm not saying all of you guys, some of you are absolutely doing this. I don't mean to put you all in one coaches all in one thing, but it's frustrating to me because I know how much this can help. And usually we just say we don't have time for it. So. Uh, so I have any books to recommend? Oh um, God, yeah. Joshua. Um, I will add a slide <laughs> on this for you, but um, Playmakers Advantage obviously has a ton of uh, uh, hockey-related stories in it, but it's what I really go on if you like any of the science behind the the why, the motor learning and development, and why I'm such a big advocate for making sure that everything we do is physiological and psychologically similar to what they're going to experience when they're trying to perform and under pressure. So if you like science, if you like that stuff, um, that is a book I'm recommending to everyone right now, The Playmaker's Advantage. It can get a little heavy in the middle with that science stuff, but just stay with it. Don't try to get, don't get dragged into the weeds if that's not your thing. Um, but that's a biggie. Um, gosh, I have just so many. I will uh, make a list. <laughs> How about that? So I'm not like, yeah, put on the spot. that sounds, and, and Dr. Tiff, you're going to be on again. I, 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 I don't think you know that yet, but you will be on okay. many times, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so I, I have another question from Wade, and this is a pretty uh, deep one. How do you motivate young kids to give more effort in practice and games? I coach 12U and often see us losing games because the kids don't give full effort. My coaches okay. and I talk about it with them, but often don't see the effort from them that I know they can give. Okay. This is like a four-hour class. Um, 
So it has to go with their behavioral styles. It has to go with their fears and the, and the fact that we're raising these kids on a very perfectionist generation. And so it's easier not to try and then be say, well, I didn't give full effort. There's so many different reasons. Every kid is different. And I often think that coaches think that the kids aren't trying and they are, they're just paralyzed with their thoughts, um, overthinking negativity, worried what everyone else is going to think. So it looks like they're not giving effort. And in reality, they're so frozen and in their heads that they're not moving and they're not, it looks like they're not trying. But I would tell you right now, 90 something percent of kids care. They're not waking up in the morning going, ha, 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 how can I screw my coaches today and make my parents really mad at me? I know I'm going to just not try. So for me, there's so many different elements to this that I train and teach all the time. So Dave, that might be something down the road to offer, but yeah. Um, I would I would get away from the effort that they don't want to. Um, my guess is that there's fear, uh, overthinking, um, perfectionism, and worried about what everyone else is thinking of them. Um, so David Schwab uh, has kind of similar, maybe a little different on the coaching side. He goes, dealing with difficult players is one thing, but how about dealing with difficult coaches? So um, just sometimes – you might be an assistant coach or you might be a goalie coach. You might be something, um, not the head coach. And you see the head coach doing stuff that you don't agree with. And it's a tough yep. situation. And I've been in it before and I know other coaches have, how, how can you deal with and not deal, but how can you help these difficult coaches maybe see, you know, the correct way? Well, again, it goes, I, I use the coach disc a lot, which is a behavioral assessment. It's like one of the only assessments I use. And a lot of times when you can understand people's behaviors, you can help adapt behavior and change behavior. Uh, and so that's, again, another whole course or, you know, a couple hour session. Um, but it starts there because when you understand someone's behavior, you understand their communication style, what motivates them, the why behind their decisions, the why behind their behavior. And again, if we can get at the why, then we can learn to how to communicate and motivate that coach um, and have discussions with that coach um, way easier than us just trying to like, because a lot of times we will behave in our natural behavioral style. And so is it that you need to adapt so that you get the coach to listen? So for me, I want to win. But when I'm like, I'm, a, I'm someone who really wants to win, but I also get all this stuff. And I'll go up to a coach who's an old school coach. Um, and they would be a D on the, on the disc, the, a big D, which is dominant, results oriented, um, not feelings based. And if I want a coach to do what I want, who's a D, I'll go up and look at them in the eye and be like, listen, you want to win? And that coach is going to say, yeah. And I said, well, then we need to do this vulnerability stuff with your team. And they look at you and I'm like, I'm like, do you want to win? And they're like, yes. I'm like, then I need to do this. And they'll let me almost all the time. But I know that that's because what they want is results. They're results driven and they're, they're, they drive standards and they just are fast paced and they want to know that this is going to help and how it's going to help. And so I talk to them like that. If I'm talking to someone who's not that, I might lean in. I put my, put my hand on their shoulder. I might be patient and calm and ask them lots of questions. So again, I have to adapt my behavior a lot when I'm working with coaches and athletes. And when you understand the behavioral stuff, it makes it a lot easier to have those difficult conversations. Um, Jason Wolf asks, any suggestions for helping comfort kids that are feeling like they have missed out on opportunities to move forward in their hockey careers? So I think you can kind of head two ways. One, for this time, you know, like there's chance for them whether they're playing at a very high level and maybe we're going to get seen by a higher level, but really at any time, you know, there's sometimes that you feel that you maybe have an injury or something. Right. Um, yeah. Again, it's having them right out there. It's your stinky first draft because that's really going to help because you're going to see all the fears and, and negativity and worries and whatever. And some of those are going to be completely valid. And then, and then some are going to be ones that you're like, okay, but this could also be an opportunity for you to work on this. Or how are we Dave, going to develop this? Or when you get back on the ice, how have you closed the gap? You know, because no one's perfect. No one is at the point where they can't improve. And I'm not going to tell them, well, this could be a great opportunity for you to do. I'm just going to say, no, you're going to choose what to do with this time. Other players are going to sit and be all upset and do nothing. And you can decide to do something different and be beast mode and get better. Now what are you going to do? But I also want them to sit in the feelings for a little bit, and that's what the first draft does, is to mourn 
all of this is to be upset and to allow that to happen. And then I'm like, and now what are you going to do? So for my college kids, I gave them two weeks because at the third week, your mind and body will start to atrophy. So I told all my college athletes, you have two weeks to, to deal with all this in however you want. I'm here for you. If you just want to be pissed off and complain to me for two weeks, you can complain to me for two weeks. But at that two week mark, it is go time. And you are going to make a decision. Are you going to beast mode this? Or are you just going to continue to go down this other path? That's the only choices you have. Um, but I do want them to be able to mourn and be sad and do all the things and go through the stages of grief. Because it is stages of grief when, you, when your career is upended. You should hear about some of my, my Olympians who just found out that they're not going to compete. And hopefully it's going to be in a year and they'll have another, another shot. But if it's two years down the road, then a lot of my athletes that I work with might not make it for two years. So um, they're not the only ones and there's other, you know, other folks and it's just, get, you know, you have choices and that's it. Uh, Steve Thompson uh, wrote with measurables being such a strong motivator and the mental side being tough to measure. Are there different tactics you recommend for consistent behavior change and adoption of these practices with our athletes? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, anything that you can make measurable, make measurable. So it could be putting the jigsaw puzzle together and how quickly can you put the jigsaw puzzle together. It could be, uh, it can be physical. It can be how many burpees do you, I'm just throwing something out, I'm not saying this is what you do, I'm just giving you a quick example, but like uh, how many burpees can you do in a minute to, so make things measurable and you're like, well, Tiff, the burpees, well, no, because the burpees are also mental because are you going to journal afterwards? Uh, what were you thinking during the burpees? Uh, was that really your best effort and your best go? Like there's lots of things that is also always going to be mental. Like anything we do is basically mental. So if you can be creative and quantify that, that's awesome. Now, what I use to quantify, and if this is something that people are interested in, you can always reach out, is something I call heartmath.com, which is a biofeedback kind of uh, company, and I use a device um, that just reads your heart rate variability, but is the coolest app on the planet. The app is called Inner Balance, and uh, with that is a way to actually quantify the mental. Um, it's a whole long story and lots of details to it, but um, that's the way I use it with my college athletes and my professional athletes right now. And then I have some of my youth development kids um, in the U18s and the U15-16s who have them. Um, and they're reaching out right now and saying, how can I use this? And so having them use it during yoga, having them use it during putting a puzzle together, having them play video games with it on, having them watch film with it on um, is a way for me to quantify whether or not they're getting better or not better. So. Uh, Tim Conrad asks, any tips for dealing with kids at the 10U, 12U level who are being introduced to technology? For example, I've seen group chats get inappropriate and include teammate bashing, things which they would never say in person but are empowered to do so when on a device. Uh, I would have an adult in there at that age. Like they should not be rogue doing it right. themselves. I know you can't control that necessarily all the time, but it, I would educate the parents in this. Um, I wish parents were more parent and not more friends because they should be managing their kids' devices and managing like what they're writing and should be checking in on it. Um, and so you, all you can do is guide the parents and guide like the team in this. But I think there needs to be at least an adult, whether it's you as a coach or a team parent that is, that you trust that is in those chats. Um, just knowing that an adult is in it tends to curtail a lot of that behavior. And Randall Schneider, I didn't even, I haven't read it yet, so I'm reading it. How do you balance performance, wins and losses against ADM player development? My Pee Wee players have developed every season. However, we are still a 500 team. For me, that's every, that's perfect. You're good. I am constantly pushed to become a more old school coach to get more out of the kids. Instead, I attempt to empower the players so they can develop their own way in their own time. Yep. Results are bullshit. Let's just be real. Like, I'm so sick and tired of, like, the results, results, results. Like, I want to win like no other, but if you don't practice and do the process, and they're freaking kids for crying out loud. Who gives a crap? No one cares what is the score of these freaking games. Like, no one in golf cares. No one in soccer even knows. Like, no one cares. No one across the world knows. No one in India cares what your freaking score is. Like, 
we've got to like this is why i love hockey is because hockey hasn't completely lost the plot like all my other sports all my other sports have lost the plot focus on the process focus on the things that you can control focus on talking about mental skills talk about your non-negotiables i can send you a picture of uh, an a very elite men's golf team who is highly successful who has totally gone away from results the coach doesn't check golf stat he doesn't talk about results he decides who the lineup is based on non-negotiables and the non-negotiables are did you control the things that you have hundred percent control on and the coaches that are starting to get away from talking about results or outcomes or perfection or any of those buzzwords that are dangerous words to use because they have you have zero control over them these are the players and the teams that I'm starting to actually see perform because they're focused on the stuff that they is all process. And I know parents are probably on you coach and I know. And so reach out to people in USA hockey because I know what the USA hockey folks want and they want process and they want fun and they want touches on the puck and they want um, character development. And I know that that's what they want because I'm around it. And so I know you might be in a hub of, of somewhere where that's not being talked about. So I would reach out to USA Hockey for support um, and maybe retraining that area or parents or whomever it is that w you've lost the plot if you're all about results right now. Like, honestly, results will come typically if the process is there, but there's no timeline and every timeline is different. And in youth sports, sometimes you can get just by on the fact that you're physical and you're a genetic freak of nature. That doesn't mean anything to me. That means nothing to me as an outsider. So if you're doing what you say you're doing, coach, like keep doing that because I can't guarantee the results are going to come. But I guarantee you that your kids are like abil your ability to adapt and ability to think and the ability to be good humans is probably off the charts. So. So uh, I want to wrap it up. I know there's a couple of other questions. We're going to have a lot more of these webinars, so make sure you check for our coaches. You check on uh, Facebook Live, but also um, we're going to do it through Zoom. So thanks a lot um, for everybody that joined. Dr. Tiff, great job as always. And this is her, her stuff online that you can contact her if you have any more questions. I have everybody's email. Uh, I can send out the slide deck when um, when it gets when we finish this all up and uh yeah that's about it you have anything else you want to leave with dr tiff no thank you so much really appreciate the time and i love you hockey folks so keep doing such awesome jobs in your in your communities and with your schools you guys are great